Uh, here's a gun I keep on my lap. And uh... Welcome back to Modern Tactical Shooting. Now you may have noticed in that short video clip, which is from Iraq 2004, there was an MP5K sitting on my lap. Uh, that was us doing our special forces thing back in northern Iraq. But in this video, it's all about history of the MP5 with special forces. Now, of course, this is not a real military MP5, but it is an HK, true HK MP5 pistol on loan to me by a good buddy of mine. I'll be using this for a reference in this video. But this will be the complete history of the MP5 and special forces. So let's go. So before I cover history of the MP5 with Special Forces, of course, I got to go over a little bit about the overall history of the MP5. Of course, it came out in 1967 and made world famous by Operation Nimrod in 1980. Now, that is the hostage rescue at the Iranian embassy in London, Princess Gate, where the SAS took out five of six of the terrorists using MP5s. And of course, that operation made the SAS world famous. And it made the MP5 world famous, and this became really the premier weapon used by tactical teams and hostage rescue teams through the 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s. This was the go-to weapon for, well, again, a lot of your special tactics teams around the world, really. This was the gold standard. Now, when it comes to the U.S. military, more often than not, when people think of the MP5 in service with U.S. Armed Forces, really probably Navy SEALs come to mind. It was probably most prolific with the Navy SEALs, I would say, in the 80s and going into the 90s. A lot of photos and videos of U.S. SEALs using the MP5. But actually, the MP5 has been in service and seen combat with U.S. Special Forces since 1980. And I'm going to get into that history of how this was used down in South America with 7th Special Forces Group uh, right now. So in 1980, a civil war in El Salvador kicked off and the U.S. government decided that we we're going to back the El Salvadorian government. And that backing came in the form of U.S. advisors. Now you got to keep in mind, this is really just five years after the last troops left Vietnam. So that was still fresh in a lot of people's minds. And because of this, uh, the advisory package was extremely limited and very low key. Uh, Green Berets, which were the advisory team going down to El Salvador, they were limited to only 55 members on the ground at any one time. And to keep from having any sort of uh, presence where they could be viewed as an offensive force, they were limited to only being allowed to carry pistols. Now, Green Berets being who they are, they found a workaround in the form of the MP5. It is, of course, a pistol caliber submachine gun. So, really, pistol and they were able to get past the pistol-only requirement with bringing MP5s really as the very first PDW. Really, what, 30 years before the term PDW even started creeping out. And of course, it's pretty well known now. But this was the original personal defense weapon that Green Berets, members of 7th Special Forces Group, took with them down to El Salvador as their primary means of protection. Now, this mission was dubbed the... Uh, double nickel mission as the nickname, again, because we're limited to only 55 Green Berets on the ground at any one time. And this mission lasted from 1981 to about 1985. There were still Americans on the ground to the uh, 90s. But during that five year period, some of these Green Berets actually used the MP5 in combat to protect themselves at bases that came under attack by guerrillas. One notable attack was in the San Miguel area. There was a special forces team on that base advising the El Salvadorian soldiers. They got attacked by a very large element. And on top of using their MP5s, they borrowed guns from the El Salvadorian army, basically hand-me-downs that they weren't really using. If you look at this photo here, and I don't know if this photo is of that exact team, but you can see some of the weapons they used uh, on top of their MP5s. Now, starting on the left, you have an FN FAL, you have an M1 Garand, looks to be a Thompson submachine gun, and then you have a BAR and two G3s. And look at the photo and you see three MP5s. Now, I was able to confirm this. I actually know somebody that actually did the double nickel mission. He said he went in after that team that had been in combat in the San Miguel area. He actually replaced one of those guys. And he said it was true when they fell in on those 
at those bases to be advisors. They borrowed guns from the El Salvadorian army to carry uh, as on top of their MP5s. Again, this is nine millimeter. So at range, it's kind of anemic. So he said it was true. They fell in on a bunch of World War weapon, uh, World War II weapons like 30 cal machine guns and BARs. And they kept those off to the side. Again, they weren't allowed to show a aggressive presence. They had to be seen solely as a defensive force because they were limited to being advisors. But some MP5s with Special Forces soldiers did get used uh, in the early 80s. So this gun has been in the inventory, rather limited in Special Forces, but its history does start in 1981. All right, now let's fast forward to the 1991 First Gulf War, Desert Storm. Now, members of 5th Special Forces Group who were deployed there and had the mission of going deep behind enemy lines to conduct reconnaissance, uh, they carried MP5s, some of the members. Uh, there is one team, ODA 525, back in February 23rd of 1991, got compromised, ended up, ended up getting in a significant gunfight with a over company size element of Iraqi soldiers. It was about 150 Iraqi soldiers against 12 Green Berets, and they are on record of killing over 40 of these Iraqi soldiers they, they got in a gunfight with, and they were holding at bay with their small arms. I actually know one gentleman that was in that firefight because he was my very first team sergeant when I showed up in Special Forces, 5th Special Forces Group in 1998, and that is Jim Weatherford. Uh, speaking to him about that battle, he said there were two members that carried MP5 SDs on the team, and they brought MP5 SDs with them, basically in case they happened to bump into sole Iraqi soldiers while they were patrolling that have a way of taking them out silently. Uh, during the major firefight when they were holding off that Iraqi company, he doesn't remember the guys using the MP5 SDs uh, solely due to the fact of the extended ranges at which the firefight took place at. They were trying to keep the Iraqis back and make space for the helicopters to come in and exfil them. So they were at rifle distance, 100 yards and beyond this engagement took place. So he doesn't remember the MP5s getting employed, but MP5s, you know, they did get taken to the first Gulf War with Special Forces soldiers. All right, now fast forward to 1998 when I arrived on my first Special Forces team. And again, Jim Weatherford, that Green Beret that saw combat in the first Gulf War in 1991, he was my first team sergeant. And I, again, I can't tell you how lucky I was to have such an experienced, and he was an awesome guy. I still talk to him once in a while to this day. But to be frank, I tried to emulate him my entire career during my time as Special Forces. He made such a big impression on me as a brand new Green Beret because he really set the standard and showed what right looked like on a Special Forces team. But getting back to the MP5, I arrived in 1998 and I believe I went on my first training deployment to Kuwait uh, just after Christmas uh, going into 1999 and we took MP5s with us. Now, at the time in 1998, 1999, not every Special Forces team had MP5s. In fact, they were kind of rare. The only teams that had MP5s assigned to them were the SIF teams, and that was the Commander's Interdiction Force, the dedicated hostage rescue teams in Special Forces. And really, the MP5 was really taking a back seat to the M4A1, which just came out in 1997. And if you remember in the mid nineties, they had that North Hollywood shootout, two armed men against the LAPD. And a lot of the LAPD only had pistols and they brought out MP5s. Those guys were armored up and the MP5s were basically useless. And that started really the domino effect of the MP5 falling out of favor with frontline tactical teams. And that was the same thing in the military. When the M4A1 carbine came out in 1997, that really put the MV5 really in the back seat compared to other weapon systems just because of the limited uh, capabilities of the cartridge. So only SIF teams actually had dedicated MP5s. Now there were some MP5s in each special forces company, but they were meant to be tr uh, used for training only, meaning the 18 Bravos, the weapon sergeants, would train on them so when we went overseas and if we ran into other militaries that we were training that had MP5s, we could be proficient on the MP5 and show these other nations' forces how to use the MP5. The MP5s in the inventory in the arms rooms were not meant to actually be used in combat. And in 1999, or 1999, we went on a training deployment to Kuwait 
And we actually signed out MP5s uh, out of Joss Loan, which is the Joint Operational Stocks Catalog. So instead of buying thousands of MP5s for them to only see limited use, uh, SOCOM basically had a catalog. It was like an old Sears catalog. You could open it up and it was filled with all these guns and radios and optics. And you could sign out these items for a combat tour or a training tour and then return them when your mission was done. And we signed out uh, 12 of your classic MP5s. Now, of course, they had full auto. Now, keep in mind these photos that I'm showing you. Yes, the quality is kind of low. That's because it was 1999 and I was using good old film cameras still at the time. Digital cameras were just hitting the scene. So I had to scan these photos in. But here you can see some training photos. Now that body armor, and of course we're wearing old school Kevlars. It's 1999, SF teams did not have that body armor and the Mitch helmet did not come out till 2000. Each SF company had 12 sets of Ranger body armor and you would sign them out from the B team for CQB training. And then when you were done, you'd turn them back into the B team. Body armor was not a thing. That didn't become a thing until 2000 when Molly came out in the spear bulk system just before, of course, the war on terror started. So again, old school photos. Now this photo right here, you can see I'm pushing the MP5 out uh, with the stock collapsed. And I'm using a push-pull method with that sling being the pull portion, uh, basically using tension to hold the MP5 in place. It's an old SAS technique. If you look at this photo here, which is from Operation Nim uh, Nimrod, that hostage rescue at the Iranian embassy. Uh, the stock has collapsed and some of the SAS assaulters are using that push-pull method. I was trying it on the range and yes, it works at room distance to put uh, bursts of fire in a man-sized target really in the chest. It's not super accurate and you're better off going with the classic uh, stock extended, but I was trying it at the time just for something to do. And those MP5s, they had screw-on suppressors. Of course, we have the SD model, and those were full auto. Now, going into the war on terror, I didn't do the invasion of Afghanistan, but I did the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Not much use for the MP5 there. Everybody was itching to take those unused M4A1s into combat. But in 2004, 2005, 2006, Special Forces... One of our main jobs became intelligence collection on that growing insurgency that was forming in Iraq. And to do that, we had to travel basically uh, low level, uh, in civilian clothes, kind of unnoticed. I can't get into exactly how we did things. Basically, we were like narco cops. Instead of looking for drug dealers, though, we were looking for terrorists. And we had to be very low profile, traveling in civilian cars, wearing civilian clothes. The M4A1 was really too large to conceal in a vehicle. So what was the solution? Well, it was to resurrect the MP5 and get MP5s out to the guys because the MP5 with the stock collapse, and of course this one doesn't telescope in like the military version, but with the stock collapsed on an MP5, this can be hidden between the seat and the center console of a car. It can be hidden under the seat. It's a very compact weapon when you're trying to conceal it in a vehicle or throw it in a small pack. Again, we did not have the Mark 18. They were starting to hit the scene, but the Mark 18s were reserved for, again, for the SIF companies. Uh, really for CQB. We needed an undercover weapon. We couldn't get Mark 18s. Teams were issued MP5s. So a gun that was designed in 1967, rose to fame in the 1980s, was now being heavily employed by certain special forces teams for a period of about three years in Iraq uh, because of a mission requirement. And their MP5Ks were being used, MP5SDs, and your classic MP5 like this one here. Now these MP5s stayed in Iraq, and as teams rotated out of locations, when they came to that location, they would fall in on a bunch of MP5s. If you look at this photo here, there's an IZ on the guns. That just stands for, it's part of the Iraq property book of items that the team would fall in on. So the MP5 was resurrected in the early 2000s as a solution to a very specific requirement. And really that was the last heavy use of the MP5, but I gotta say the MP5 went out in style really uh, in 2004, 2005, 2006. Uh, you couldn't ask for really a, a better way to end 
such a the prolific use of such a great classic submachine gun. Going into 2007, I was a instructor at our primary CQB schoolhouse, and we did still employ the MP5 when it came to tubular targets, meaning trains and airplanes with that few long fuselage when you're worried about overpenetration. We would train soldiers on the MP5 as the weapon they went in with, but in 2007, that even ceased to exist, and we started going to just using pistols anytime there was an overpenetration issue. I think that was a mistake because that was the last time we actually did formal training with the MP5 submachine gun in Special Forces. Now, they still exist out there in Special Forces companies, but again, they've been regulated to the role of training items only. For 18 Bravos, again, to practice on in case they run into other militaries that they have to train around the world. So the primary use of this being a combat weapon, again, truly its last heyday were those early years in Iraq. But I carried one of these uh, countless times. And let me talk about how I employed this when I was out and about in Iraq. Now I know in this picture right here, we are a walking 511 catalog, but this was 2004. And honestly, we didn't wear those vests out and about. We threw them on for that photo, but why were we wearing 511 vests? Well, you gotta remember 2004, there was only a fraction of the tactical gear companies that are out now. And I actually still have that 511 vest. Here it is right here. And the reason why we wore these vests, we actually didn't wear them. We, we put them on for that photo, but for that uh, mission where we had to be very low profile, we didn't want anything military in our cars in case people walked by when we were in traffic and things like that. Now we wore concealable body armor, but you couldn't have chest racks and stuff like that laying around in your car. We would load up these 511 vests, and this is why they became so popular in the 2000s with every military contractor, is they're purpose-built to basically to be like an assault vest. They have de dedicated pockets for magazines dedicated pockets for water bottles. So really it's an assault vest in civilian look. Uh, now granted, come 2005, 2006, everybody was wearing 511 and it became completely overblown. But back in 2004, uh, we had these and I would load this up and I could jam it on the floorboard of my car. That way, if we did get compromised, I could throw on the 511 vest. At least I had the bare essentials that I needed on me in a firefight. So uh, at least for a little while, these were actually super practical. And then of course they became overblown. And it's if you wanna get shot first, then yes, throw on one of these vests nowadays. But again, back in 2004, this actually started out as a very practical piece of kit. Now, later on, 2005, I actually went to a little uh, bag, a little go bag, and this is, I don't believe this is my original go bag, but this is my original submachine gun mag pouch right here. It's just zip tied on the back of this, but I use one of these little combat lifesaver bags as my go bag in the vehicle. Again, you couldn't have a super giant go bag. If you can't get it on with one hand in a firefight, then it's too big. And this little combat lifesaver bag was just big enough. I have a two magazine pouch on the back and I would throw a few more extra mags in here. I carried one grenade. You can have a complete IFAC in this bag and everything you need for a radio and spare batteries and stuff. So with my MP5 collapsed, I could have stuck between the center console of a vehicle and the car seat. And I could have this on the floor just under my legs. So I had everything I needed if we need to bail out of the car for a firefight. And it's very low profile. So if you looked into the car, unless you really gave it a deep look, you wouldn't see these items. Now, you may have noticed in some of the pictures, and I got asked this, I believe it was Instagram, what sling I'm using. That's actually just a single tubular nylon loop. And then it's bungeed uh, to the sling swivel on the MP5, a homemade sling. We The only slings we got issued were the original canvas, I believe, uh, HK MP5 slings, the same slings that the SAS used in the 1980s. It was a three-point sling, and that was just too complicated. So I just made my own out of tubular nylon. And as far as the lethality of an MP5 in Iraq, because again, you're going to be going against AK-47s, my plan was to give them P for plenty. It's a submachine gun, and you ought to be using the full auto feature on here to make up for that anemic power of the 9mm. So any threat 
uh, worth shooting once is really worth giving half a magazine to. So that was always my plan. Full out of the target and drive the threat down. All right, now I want to cut to some range training, a video I made back in 2005. So I'm warning you now it's going to be a little grainy, but me doing some MP5 training in Iraq. And at the end of the video, you're going to see a UMP45, and I'll talk about that after the clip. Now, it was halfway through my last trip in 2005 that 5th Special Forces Group brought in two UMP-45s per ODA, and they were brought in to replace the MP-5 to give SF guys a little bit more stopping power, for lack of a better term, uh, for that low-profile mission. But honestly, those UMP-45s are huge. Uh, I did carry one, but for low-profile, they're actually quite large and honestly a lot of teams uh, used them in CQB instead it was very popular yes people say it's a submachine gun but I'm telling you 45 ACP that 230 grain ball bullet at room distance is pretty devastating so it was favored by a lot of SF guys uh, for CQB now this photo right here at first I thought it was ODA 596 in Kirkuk I was 591 in fact this is my old team hat from my Iraq days ODA 591, but looking at this photo, I think this is a 5th Special Forces group down in Tikrit, but it is that time frame 2005. Now, if you may have noticed in all the UMP 45 photos, there's no optics on those guns. Now, 5th Special Forces group did purchase optic rails and optics for the UMP 45s, but they never made it down range. They were back in supply when we got back. Uh, and it was Seymour railway, uh, railway sites that they purchased for the UMP-45s. But they didn't get used on the UMP-45s. A lot of guys actually put them on their M4s. That's why you see a lot of old school SF photos with guys with Seymour optics on some of their rifles. Now, I don't know what happened to those UMP-45s. I'm, I'm pretty sure 5th Special Forces Group was the only SF group to get the UMP-45. And I think they've long been since turned in. I haven't seen one uh, since I left 5th Special Forces Group in 2006. Maybe a former or active duty 5th Special Forces Group guy will comment down below what happened to them. But I don't think they're in service at all anymore. And as far as the MP5, really its use really ended in 2007. At least that's what I saw at the schoolhouse. Again, some of these still exist in SF companies, but they're mainly used as a training tool, uh, not operationally at all anymore. Their time has passed. But some of the most dangerous missions I've ever done, some of the most dangerous things I've done in SF, I did, and I did it while carrying an MP5. So this is always going to hold a special place in my heart, just because, uh, again, some of the most dangerous situations I've ever been in, this is the firearm that I had on me to protect my life if it came down with, came down to it. So MP5, uh, storied item, storied weapon, well deserving of its history and the saga of this being a premier special forces, special operations, uh, tier one weapon with a lot of your tactical teams around the world for such a long time. So MP5, again, well, I can't really say anything bad about it. But as always, hopefully you found this video entertaining and enjoyable. A little bit longer than what I wanted to cover uh, time-wise, but really I wanted to get all I could with regards to history of the MP5. So again, hopefully this was entertaining and enjoyable. I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.